What up, what up, what up, Creation Grounds peeps. This is episode 46 and I'm your host, Aaron Lloyd. Before I get into our next brilliant guest, I want to encourage you to like, share, subscribe, tell anybody who you think will gather some value from it, be entertained, educated, and all of that. My next guest is Dale Rose. Mr. Rose is a teacher of mine who I had while I was at UConn and was a brilliant, influential force in my growth as an actor. I had him for two out of the four years that I was at UConn and um, had the pleasure of being directed by him in several other productions. He is an artistic giant. I really like his artistic sensibilities. He is super knowledgeable, uh, a gold mine of just craft and, and theater and just 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 growing as an actor. Um, I feel enriched and enlightened anytime I talk to him about just in terms of my own artistic sensibilities. And I, I pray that after listening to this episode, you'll see that he can do the same for you. In this episode, he talks about craft. How do you study and become a better actor during the pandemic? How, how, what, how do you how do you explore yourself during this time to to get better? He talks about Stanislavski, and if you don't know who that is, you'll know after this episode why he was important to the craft and to acting and things like that. He talks about some things that have shaped him in his life and influenced his life and, and books that he shared and read and, and plays and movies that have moved him. This episode is great. I know you're going to enjoy it. Enjoy this episode with Dale Rose. I'm very excited to welcome a dope professor I had at UConn. Taught me a lot of what I know about acting. Helped me get dive into the craft, Stanislavski, and all this kind of stuff. Mr. Dale Rose, what up, Dale? Hello, hello. <laughs> where where were you born, Dale? Uh, I was born in Detroit. Dope. Um, and I grew up south of Detroit uh, on a farm, uh, which I do think was enormously valuable for me. <laughs> Uh, as far as something we might go into, uh, it was a great place to uh, use your imagination. Beautiful. So, yeah, yeah. And when, w- tell me about the day that you discovered your passion for the arts. So you grew up in Detroit. It's very kind of, I guess the imagination was part of it. But what, what drew you to the arts? Um, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not sure. I know that there were incidents that were interesting to me that piqued my curiosity or did something either to my heart, my mind, my imagination. Uh, And, uh, and I think I was benefit. It was beneficial that uh, it was, we had a small school and we would do road trips, you know, or basically go to Detroit. And I remember one time, um, going to see, and I was in grade school, going to see Charles Lawton, an actor from a long time ago. Yeah, I don't uh, recognize him. he was doing at the Ethel Ford uh, Auditorium. He was doing a one-man show in which um, I think I had already seen him in the old 1930s Hunchback of Notre Dame. Wow. Uh, so that, my, I knew that he had done film. This guy walks on the stage carrying a huge stack of books and um, and drops one. Purposely? And looks at us at the audience, looks at the stack in his hands, looks at the one on the floor, and then all of these in his hands just like explode out of his hands. And he bends down, grabs the book on the floor, opens it to a certain page, and starts to read. Wow. And that, see, I got goosebumps right now, (laughs) recalling it. And suddenly, the spoken word became so exciting. Uh, He read stuff from Moby Dick. He read stuff from uh, uh, some poems, etc. And I just, as a kid, was mesmerized because I hadn't ever heard someone speak text. Mm -hmm. to my knowledge Um, and I would say that uh, uh, later when I was in high school uh, there was a lot of theater activity going on in Detroit and there was a new theater at that time called the Vanguard Theater and their first production was Pierre Gint Mm -hmm. and 
there were, I mean, they had ladders. That was about it as far as the set goes. I just was agog. Uh, and I know it was over three hours long and everything and, you know, and blah, blah, blah. I just went, wow, I have no idea what this is, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, and I, I had done some plays uh, in drama class or, or the high school, but I was going to be a veterinarian. That's a big leap. And that, that was my goal. <laughs> <laughs> wow. But those, so it's it's little things like that that were suddenly very um, piqued me as far as there's another kind of world than what I knew being on the farm. And uh, once I went to college, I think that uh, and couldn't handle the math. So, <laughs> so I went from there to psychology and, <laughs> and, and psychology and speech therapy and then into theater and dance. And um, uh, I think I found my voice, so to speak, through dance because I found the physical expression far more potent than the spoken word. And, uh, and I think that as I matured, to be able to bring those together about what, you know, uh, as, as you may recall when I said in John, and, and uh, uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Mm-hmm. That is my mantra. Yeah. So those things came out of there. And then there were other things that sort of helped me focus on things that I wanted to do. But those would be the initial ones. Those two. That's amazing, man. And who is Stanislavski? Who is he and why is he important? Well, um, (laughs) he's probably now, what, what well, you know, the terminology is the father of uh, modern acting or modern drama. Um, And probably probably the great, great grandfather of modern acting and modern drama. Um, But in 1898, he had had already formed the Moscow Art Theater and wanted to find how to put on stage what would be truthful as opposed to a lot of things like sawing at the air and da 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 da. Mm -hmm. What is truth? How do we convey truth uh, both from an inner emotional life from the physical being, if I'm a peasant or I'm a king or whatever I am, and what what are the tools that one can explore in order to allow that to happen? Um, and and so the the first play they did was uh, the was the um, the seagull. So going with that, with the naturalism of uh, Chekhov. And continuing to explore what it is that makes a performance real. So, however we've diverted from that, or various other teachers, etc., mm-hmm. the the fundamental tools are still the ones that he explored. And of course. Um, when he came to America for a short time and working with members of the group theater in the, maybe the very early thirties. Um, and then people like Stella Adler and, um, uh, Bobby Lewis and, uh, and, um, Sanford Meisner went over to Russia to work with him some more. Um, and Stella Adler came back, and it really changed how she worked as an actor. And um, and she was one of my teachers, so I'm one removed from Stanislavski from that standpoint. <laughs> That's you know? incredible. But but the whole thing is, and what's amazing is, is he never stopped searching with that elusive thing about what brings truth to a performance. Mm -hmm. And um, a 
lot of people think, oh, it's all that he was always about what's inside and how that's coming out. But that's not true, because often as he was exploring more and more his craft, it was also about how do we do this if we come from the outside? What is the outside of this character? And by exploring that physically, how do we start to tap into something deeper? Mm. As, as an emotional truth, an intellectual truth, how do we use the creative imagination to allow us, allow you to do a Hamlet that would be far different than my Hamlet? Right. Because we're involved not just in our intellect, but with our creative imagination. I love that. And for you, what... What play or role has impacted you the most and why? Mm. That, that's a toughie because I've lived a long life. <laughs> <laughs> what The first one um, on your mind. So I, have to, so I have to go way back again. Um, I think along that same time of what I mentioned earlier, um, I saw uh, the original production of A Raisin in the Sun Wow. Um, that Lloyd Richards directed before it went to Broadway in 58. Was that at Yale 19- Rep? Hmm? Was that at Yale Rep, the first one? No, no, this was this was uh, at the Schubert Theater in Detroit. Oh, wow, okay. It's a tour, a tour. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it, was, it hadn't gone to Broadway yet. Mm-hmm. Um, and, I, and, and uh, you know, like many of the theaters, it's, it was an old um, kind of beautiful theater that doesn't exist anymore, but I remember being in the, could have been the second balcony, but maybe the first balcony. But I'm sitting there, and it's the only time, uh, at least at that time and for many, many years after, that I the walls of the theater literally disappeared for me. You were in it. And I was in the younger household. Wow. And... Um, uh, it, it was uh, so overpowering um, and so so um, right for for us living in Detroit um, that it just uh, it was just awesome and and it was my first uh, uh, opportunity to see Ruby D on stage. Wow, what a blessing, and, man. Which I then toured with her. I did not know so, this. You yeah, wait, yeah. wait, wait, Dale, 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 Dale. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Time out, time out, man. You worked with Ruby D? Yeah, yeah. I didn't know this. To, to, in, in a touring production of to, young, to Be Young, Gifted, and Black. I was the only white guy. <laughs> 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 That's still incredible, man. That's dope. That's incredible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, what what are three what are one to three books that has greatly shaped your life or influenced your life? It could be an acting book or just a regular book, something that's really shaped you. Yeah. Um. Well, I would first have to say The Prophet by Gibran. I, I remember though. Yeah, I remember that. Mm-hmm. It has book. always uh, uh, it has always brought me insight and comfort. Mm-hmm. Um and. I think uh, speaks so much to a human condition and how we do or do not do things uh, in this world. Uh, but what what would bring about a greater blessing to humanity? So mm-hmm. that has always been uh, uh, foremost for me. Um, Peter Brooks' book, *The Empty Space*, mm-hmm. um, as I first started thinking about theater that was very influential um, and and made me look back uh, I, and which I do time and time again on just the sense of what is sacred what isn't what's uh, you know what's happening commercially etc so mm-hmm. and I guess I would have to say all of Shakespeare yeah Shakespeare is uh, incredible. I it's still... a toss-up between the Bible and Shakespeare. <laughs> they're they're kind of on the same plane, man. It's just, you know, if we're, if we're being honest. <laughs> that's dope, but, man. But that's because I hated Shakespeare. Yeah. I just loathed it. 
for the longest time uh, until probably the mid seventies. In fact, I, my first Hamlet was a send up of, of Shakespeare because uh, I loathed the character. And <laughs> anyway, <laughs> what shifted for you that you now you loved it? I mean, you hated it. Well, what happened then... is that I I started working with Kristen Linklater. Oh yeah, yeah. And my and... whole thing that I loved before was the physicalization of a character. Mm-hmm. Um, is the physical life with the life and muscularity of the language became so exciting. And then it started to unlock the images that are there that I find uh, speaks, constantly speaks to us, uh, no matter who we are, what generation, gender, yeah. color. Yeah. Yeah. I don't. I, I know it's hard sometimes thinking. Well, he's a dead white man. Mm. I just think that he's one of the great poets. I think and, so. I agree. Uh, his words speak. They sing, man. So when what? I know you were a teacher at SMU. Then you came to UConn. UConn is from where I know you. But when did you start teaching? And what what made you want to start teaching acting? I didn't. Um, <laughs> you didn't uh, want to teach. <laughs> <laughs> I I was. Uh, I was working in uh, in Tampa, Florida, mm-hmm. and I uh, was teaching improv and I was teaching movement class. But I had had several accidents skiing and otherwise, and so my knee was not good. And I would like do something and I'd collapse, and the whole class would collapse. Like that was part of the movement, and I couldn't stand it anymore. Yeah. And I got a phone call from uh, Jack Clay at SMU and said would I be interested in coming and teaching movement because the movement teacher is going to be on sabbatical? And I says, no, I can't teach movement anymore. I can't see my life in my face anymore. And he says, well, what about teaching acting? And I says, well, I've never taught acting. He says, and I says, so I don't. And I said, no, 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 my dear boy, that's not what I've heard. That's not what I've heard. So I went in and I, I, I did an interview or I, I did a class in which all I was told later that Jack Clay came up to the other faculty. He's, what he's doing is just trying to test the students, right? That's what he's doing. <laughs> I had no idea what I was doing. And uh, they hired me on the spot. And with the idea, they were sending me to New York, all expenses paid, to work with um, a teacher there uh, the summer before I would start to teach. Mm-hmm. And... Um, my theater in Tampa had just gotten a seventy-five thousand dollar grant, mm-hmm. and so they were going to be fine for a while. And I thought, this is this is an adventure that I think I need to do. So that's what started it. And I'm grateful. I'm grateful that you started it, man. Um, I've been taught by you and genuinely learned a lot from you. So I appreciate mm. you um, and the gift that you've given to me. What what is what is a bad recommendation in acting or teaching acting that you've heard over the years? Well, that's, that's tough. I, I, um, uh, when I was teaching in New York, there were a lot of gurus mm-hmm. who would say things like, no, 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 you have to stick with me and stay and take more of my classes before you even try something professionally. Mm-hmm. And that's a strange Bengali kind of thing, which I find creepy. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm hoping that's not so much anymore. But um, I would say the one thing that to me is 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 um, uh, is is not a is um, is saying to someone you don't need technique. Mm. Just what you have, the raw material you have, that's going to do it for you. Now, and it's very likely it would for a while but without technique to be able to uh, explore and balance what you're trying to do so that it's not about eliminating the rawness or uh, what I would say is more of the emotional connection physical connection Mm -hmm. but it's about how do I guide it Mm -hmm. and so that for the stage it's repeatable Mm -hmm. because I know too many performances where in fact somebody would say open night oh my god that was just incredible just incredible two nights later he couldn't find it again right couldn't find that spirit and 
you know, that was when audiences didn't pay so much. <laughs> you know, you right. can't afford that anymore. Yeah. And and it, I think it's doubly true now on film. Yeah. Uh, wherever a film is going to go, but um, there's n- there's no time to waste money. Yeah. So you need to have a sense of technique that um, is um, is balanced by your creativity in how you get under the skin of the character. And creating a skill out of it. How can an actor improve their craft while not actively in a show? So what if an actor is listening or somebody and they're like, well, I'm not currently in a show. How do I work my craft? I'm here by myself. Do I need a scene partner? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll let you answer. But how, how can an actor improve their craft even while not actively in a film tv set or on stage in rehearsals well i think that there are are a number of things that can happen and of course um i this has been a question that people have come to me about on on on, on zoom such a such and that one thing is in this time of solitude um you can do a greater internal search Mm. what's authentic in me what is it and dare yourself to go there Mm -hmm. what are the elements that really I've been either holding back or uh, I touch on them and I I freeze or something how do you start to breathe into that and let that go and nurture your work that's something you can do in solitude Mm -hmm. and then in an ideal situation maybe in some other building, so you're doing it on Zoom, you have a comrade who is also wanting to explore, and then start exploring pieces of text that allow you to reveal as you're playing off of each other. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, And it's not a substitute for touch, which is important, Mm. but how do you play off of each other? as truthfully as you possibly can there's nothing to lose yeah. by doing this because no one's watching right um and the other thing that i think is really important is find a skill now i'm not talking about being the best waiter <laughs> <laughs> find a skill like juggling mm-hmm. uh magic tricks, Mm -hmm. uh, balancing, other things that you can add to your portfolio Mm -hmm. that you can use when the time is right. And and that may be, I mean, it's actually in New York, it's easier right now as long as like Ripley Greer is keeping the place clean, Mm -hmm. that you can rent a place and go in there with uh, some balls and juggle and juggle or learn an instrument that you haven't learned before take voice classes on zoom yeah so those are the things that it's it's in a way it's a less pressured time to um, expand who you are as a creative individual i love that i love that Uh, and what do you believe now that you didn't believe five years ago too much <laughs> like <laughs> well I, I I believe one sad thing mm. in that it's much harder for an act for someone follow, going into the acting profession without being independently wealthy Wow because you have to do so much the kind of things I've just been sharing with you about, are the things if you have and under the COVID we have a kind of luxury of time Mm -hmm. doesn't mean it's filling our belly right but but those people who have the luxury of time because either they have other incomes or family monies or their own monies or something that allows them if they're good at it to not have to worry about other things other than how do I become the best actor I can be. And I find that that is so hard now. 
so so very hard yeah i would agree with you man I can, yeah, yeah uh, it's um yeah it's definitely definitely how do you create some kind of financial independence so you could just truly yeah. focus on your craft right um because i know those people who said okay i'm gonna do this job and da da da, da i'm just gonna focus on this job and then three years later it's like well i think i've got the funds now now i'm rusty mm. as an actor but i'd really be able to flip that pancake so well <laughs> yeah i feel that um tell me about a moment that that felt like a failure at the time but later set you up for success <laughs> oh which one um <laughs> uh when i uh when i was uh younger um I got to play the son in um, the play, uh, Subject Was Roses, about the mother and father and the sons coming back from the army. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it was so much, or at least as I projected it, my own life, that I just masturbated all over the stage. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, I felt so good. <laughs> yes, yes. Tell him off. Tell off the father. Wait a minute, mother. It's your fault. Da 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 da. da all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And my teacher at the time, <laughs> I'm kind of beaming, like you know, and he's going, "Are you through?" And I says, "What do you mean?" He says, "Did you get that out of your system so that you can really create?" Well, I literally threw up in that spot, yeah. or like. Yeah, I, 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 right, I mean, I was in the dressing room and I, it just, it so devastated me. Mm -hmm. And, and the first, the first reaction is I want to punch him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then it was like, wow. Yeah. Yeah. And then I was able to work on another play, uh, playing a, a, college student and um uh and uh i got in the, i was in the zone mm -hmm. with, and the same teacher then said well what was that like and i says well if that was acting i've never done it before because it felt so and, well yeah because I was there with my partner. I was there with the circumstances. This is what I need. It was big for me in my life. I had to do this. Mm -hmm. It was life or death. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like histrionics or anything, but it was, I need, help me, help me, help me. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, that, that really got me on the tra trajectory of what it was to be truthful. Mm. It's not easy, man. As you know, it's yeah. not easy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what What is the last play or film that moved you? If Beale Street Could Talk. Mm -hmm. And um, there's three of them, I think. If Beale Street Could Talk, um, Dark Water. I haven't seen that one. And, uh, with uh, Ruffalo. Uh, um, I check it's, it out. it's about um, a small community that uh, has the DuPont factory there and the, the poisons are getting into the water. This is a true story wow. for the creation of Teflon mm. and it's causing all sorts of cancers with the children and the parents and on and on. And they're just covering it up, covering it up, covering it up, covering up. So that really affected me in, in, a, in, a, in a life way. And then the other one would have been um, Ed Norton, um, uh, Motherless Brooklyn. Wow, he wrote that, didn't he? He was trying to get that he produced wrote for a that, while. Directed it, and stars in it, and there are moments where I says, "Ooh, this is excessive," and then I went, "Damn, damn, <laughs> he isn't really going all out in creating that character." Wow, dope. And what book have you gifted the most in the past year? The Overstory by Richard Powers. Okay. <laughs> it's uh it's incredible um uh I, I was i was very pleased that i saw in in several weeks of the uh new york times book review that people like david byrne and jane fonda 
all had said this is the book that has been most uh, rewarding in their reading recently. It has changed my relationship to trees. Uh, the overstory is what is it that's growing over us? Mm -hmm. And the writer is just, the language is beautiful. And it's, it's the, the stories about, I think about seven different people and their relationship with things that happening on the farm or in the city and all that, that have also to do with trees and how some force is sort of bringing them together, hopefully to stop the destruction of these living creatures, which are trees. Mm -hmm. So it's, yeah, I, I, I can't see a tree outside in my yard without thinking of it. That's beautiful. It's beautiful. Yeah, it is. It is. What and you mentioned um, that you had an art. You you kind of had an art gallery prior to the pandemic. You had a collection of coffee. Do you want to get into that a little bit and share share your artistic? I uh, sure. Um, yeah. Uh, if it's something you want to share. Yeah, yeah. Um, I I, uh, I think in in it was like in nineteen sixty eight or something, and I was visiting uh, a girlfriend in Berkeley, California. I was in, coming from New York City, and uh, and then on the while I was waiting for her, on the table or something in the living room was this sort of comic book um, that had strips in it from our crumb, and I said, "Wow, this is weird. This is interesting." And then went to eat, and there was the in the um, Berkeley Underground Press there was another strip of his in there, and. Then uh, there was a little interview in which it says that he gave up his job at American Greetings in order to really say the things he wanted to say through uh, illustration for no money. Wow. <laughs> and I went, that's a fool. <laughs> <laughs> but then I go back to New York. He's on the he's on the cover of the uh, uh, East Village Other. I'm at the Chicago Convention in '68, and the Chicago paper has his stuff. I started collecting the comics, and then uh, later, uh, when some of his artwork started to go out into prints and bigger pieces, I started collecting some of those uh, that really spoke to me, mm. um, and um, and eventually. I didn't realize this, but you know, I think I've said it a couple of years ago, when or two years ago, when uh, 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 Barry Rosenberg said, "Dale, you know, um, you were you're very interested in our crumb," and through one thing or another, I says, "Well, you should see what I have," and so uh, I started gathering everything. Some of it was just like in storage my ex-wife had some and <laughs> so i started gathering things and uh and i went oh my god i have a lot i have a lot and he came by and says you've got a lot <laughs> let's do a gallery exhibition wow so that's that's how that came about cool i ask all my guests this um when you think of the word creative and i'm, I'm really curious about your answer when you think of the word creative Who's the first person that comes to mind to you and why? Wow, that's a, uh, you said that um, uh, uh, there's a duality here. Um, I would have to say that it's it, it could be John Cage or it could be Merce Cunningham. Okay, and why? Um, uh, John Cage because of his of his creative sort of uh, I want to say a Zen kind of sense of what chance is mm -hmm. in creating something and how do you don't ever think something's going to go wrong it's going to be different hmm. and how does it become different because you already have all of the work you've done up to that moment and now you press a little button and it goes into a different direction. Mm -hmm. So from that standpoint, Merce, Cum Merce Cunningham, because they work in tandem with each other, um, uh, was able to do the same thing in movement. That just was um, awesome. Awesome. Beautiful, man. This has been a great 
I've really enjoyed talking to you. And how can people coming towards the end? What, how can people connect with you? If uh, do you do you want to connect with people via email or or social media or? Well, I would say since I'm uh, not quite set up social media wise, um, <laughs> that one uh, I would first say probably email is the best right now because mm. uh, I'm not quite sure how to do it. You can give me expertise later <laughs> how to do it more on Facebook. But I also am being encouraged to set up a site uh, to just find out about people who might want to work on individual things right now, uh, whether that's a particular role or just how uh, just self-expression. Yeah. So I think use the Yukon email right now. So can I share here right now? So they hear. Yeah. Yeah. So it's dale.rose at yukon.edu. And Dale is D-A-L-E dot Rose, R-O-S-E, at yukon.edu. Dale Rose, man, it's been beautiful. Um, talking to you, like, I'm just having, I expressed to you, like, when I asked you to come on the podcast, how just just being at UConn, being able to do what I love to do 24-7 in a conservatory setting, even back then, I knew that after those four years, then you're in New York, you're paying bills, you don't have the luxury of doing that. So it's a blessing just listening to you and just reigniting that 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 sense of just artistry um, from talking to you right now. So I appreciate that. Well, I, and I thank you because it was like when you gave me the questions. There are times now one starts looking back on things that influenced them. Mm -hmm. And that becomes a very uh, a rich exploration. So I appreciate uh, you inviting me to do so. Dale Rose.